Have you ever been on the hamster wheel of worry, just round and round and you can't stop? Well, today I'm going to talk about what research says about worry, what actually helps and what doesn't. Hi, I'm Paige Pradko. Welcome to Therapy for a Better Life. Before I get right into worrying, I would love to ask you for a favor. I have a passion in sharing mental health help and information, and you can help me by doing that by subscribing and sharing the videos, liking them, leaving me comments and questions. I also love to hear what you would like to hear more about and where you're from. But let's get going into what helps with worry. Now, worry is just really a normal human function. We all worry and it is there to help us plan, to protect us, to help uh, keep us safe. But sometimes worry can be very unproductive. Now, worry is a central feature of every anxiety disorder, but it is especially central in generalized anxiety disorder or GAD. Now, worry can be what we call egosyntonic, which means it's in line with our values, and we see that in GAD. Or worry can be uh, egodystonic, which means it is really not in harmony with what, how we see ourselves or our world or what our values are, and we see that a lot in OCD. Now, as I said, worry can be productive, but it can also be unproductive. Um, I want to I want to go a little bit into that a, a little deeper. Now, productive worry means that we have a worry and it is solvable. It is something that we need to plan. But unsolvable worry are the questions that come up in our mind, the worry scenarios that are unsolvable. We have no control over them. That's where it gets problematic. Now, worrying has two components. It has the first thought that pops into your mind, and it is a cognitive process. It is a thinking process. It happens in the prefrontal cortex. Worry is not an emotion. It's something that we're doing on purpose. So the, the first part is the question, the what if scenario pops into our brain. Now, the second part is our attempt at answering that question. And that's what can create this compulsive cycle, is if we continue to try to answer an unsolvable question, like we're trying to search for certainty and control, and we can't have any, because it's not possible. Um, so what we want to do there is we want to allow that thought to be there, that worry to be there, but not do the part two with unsolvable problems, not try to answer that question. But let me talk a little bit more about what research says doesn't help with worry. Uh, some of these examples came from Martin Seif and Sally Winston. Now, first of all, when somebody says just relax, because relax is passive, it's not an active thing like, oh, let me go hurry up and relax. <laughs> you know. And so the more we try to relax, the more worrying we're going to have and probably anxiety that we're going to feel. Whatever we resist, if we're trying to resist worrying, anything we try to resist will persist. Now, when someone says, stop worrying or you're gonna make yourself sick, that actually causes a bigger problem because then people begin to worry about worrying, which is what we call a meta-worry, right? Uh, also, reassurance is not helpful in worrying because somebody telling you everything is gonna be okay, even though it feels good in that moment, what happens is that it creates a cycle where the person needs that reassurance over and over and over again, and it can create worry cycles. Now, what's also not very helpful is when someone tries to suppress it or distract themselves. 
because whatever, again, that we try not to do, uh, we, we will get more of. And so um, just, you know, like that old thing, don't think of the blue elephant, right? We think of it more. Uh, a researcher named Wegner also discovered that we have an internal mechanism in our brain that if we try to suppress something or distract and not think of it, our brain will has a mechanism that keeps checking to see if we're thinking of it. So that's how we can get into another cycle, a reinforcing cycle in, in our worry. Um, now, some people will say, oh, think of good things, you know, only all oh, think of good things. And we can try to force ourselves to think of good things, but this also can become a compulsive cycle. It's called neutralizing, where you're going to try to, you have a bad thought or a worry and you're going to try to put a good thought in your head. And that can become a compulsive cycle that creates more cycles of worry. Also, the same thing can happen on someone that says, you know, have faith and pray it away. If we are praying every time that there is a worry and we follow up the worry with a prayer, we're also creating a, a ritualization, which is a reinforcing cycle of the worry. Now, some people will say, well, have a healthy lifestyle, do all those healthy things, eat healthy, um, exercise, all of that. Um, that can help with anxiety, but it doesn't help with necessarily with worry. We don't have evidence to show that. Uh, also looking into yourself for deeper insights. Why am I having all these worries? Why do I have that thought? Uh, those deeper insights, uh, that type of work or therapy doesn't help with worry. There, there isn't evidence there either. So let's talk about what there is research evidence for. What does help us with worry? The first thing I want to get across is we need to have an overall acceptance of whatever that worry thought is. That first part of worry, when it pops into your mind, whatever it is, we have to have an acceptance of it, not a reaction to it. And the acceptance is we're going to notice it, mindfully notice it, notice what our thought is, and with, without urgency, and also just you know non-judgmentally. Non we're just going to allow it to be there. I have a video where I talk a little bit more about this. It's called What Not to Do When You Have Anxiety, and I'll leave a link for that. We have to change our paradigm of what to do with worry and what to do with these what-if scenarios that, that hit our brain. Uh, Dr. Reed Wilson calls it the game, and he says the game is rigged. Don't answer the what if scenario, because the game is rigged. You can't win the game. It'll just create a compulsive cycle and keep coming back at you. So for an unsolvable worry, you simply just notice the worry thought that's there and you don't respond to it. Now, if there is a productive worry, and I say productive because we can solve it, we can plan something out and solve it, yeah, you, you go ahead and do that. You create an action plan and you solve the worry. But if you notice that you're just trying to get control, you're just trying to get certainty about something, then we know it's an unproductive cycle and we have to not answer that, that what if question. Now, um, Reed Wilson also has this expression he uses that worry is background noise that what if is a background noise. And he's always talking about, just let that background noise be there. Don't, don't listen to it, just let it be there. And I kind of like that coined expression that he uses, background noise. Now, what is also very helpful is to do what I call worry exposures. Now, my favorite worry exposure is assigning people a worry time that they pick a time of day, maybe 4.30 in the afternoon or some time of day, and they sit down and they just focus on worrying. They are gonna worry really good and really hard, maybe 15, 20 minutes. This works great with kids, but it also works great with adults that you schedule worry. And it just, it gives your brain, so if worries pop up, 
any time of the day, you just say, okay, at 4.30, I'm gonna worry about that. You can even make a little note of it and worry about it later. Your brain likes to know that you are making a time to think about this. And it's very, very effective. Now, you can also record your worries. You can record them. We do this a lot in, uh, in treating obsessive thoughts and we listen to the worry over and over again. Now I have a video that goes into more detail about how to record a script. Uh, it is a form of imaginal exposure and I'll leave a link to that video as well. Now, there are some other kind of things that we can do with, that are exposures, but we're playing with the worry a little bit. One of those is singing our worries. I use this a lot with people and uh, the embarrassing part is when they ask me to show them an example because I can't sing. <laughs> but, but you can sing your worry to like maybe the happy birthday song or any other tune and it really works. Um, it's, it's wonderful. Also playing with it by changing your voice, saying the worry out loud in a silly, funny voice. It really helps. Um, Another technique, I uh, it seems like I have a video for everything, but I did a video on stopping intrusive thoughts where I introduced a technique that I call uh, the I am technique. This is one of my own techniques and the acronym is I am and I stands for identify. So you identify you just had a worry thought and A in I am is for allow. I'm gonna just allow it to float there, just gonna allow it to be there. And then the M is I am going to mindfully connect to the moment that I'm living in. What do I see? What do I hear? Where am I? I'm gonna mindfully connect to the moment I'm living in. <clears throat> and then the last part of M <clears throat> is that I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on to whatever I was doing before I had this thought. So I, I can leave a link to, to that video as well. Now, there is a CBT technique that is helpful for worry, and it's called the Downward Arrow uh, by David Burns. And it starts off a little bit like this. You say what your worry is, you know, okay, I'm afraid I'm going to fail the test. Now, the, what you ask is, then what? And so, well, then I guess I will fail the class. Oh, then what? Then I guess I will fail out of the university. Well, then what? Well, then I guess I will uh, be homeless and um, end up, you know, living on the street or maybe I'll end up in jail. You know, so this, you know, it doesn't usually go that fast, but every time I do this technique with someone, they always end up either homeless or in jail, seems like. And um, this technique kind of really highlights how our thinking goes to the worst case scenario. And it does this either all or nothing or this kind of negative filter thinking that takes us right down. And in a way that wakes us up about, hey, maybe, maybe I can live with my worry. Now, um, we also have to think about with worries about reducing all of our avoidance behaviors. And some of these avoidance behaviors where we're trying to avoid the worry or somehow calm ourselves down a little bit with this worry that um, uh, we have to, you know, stop the procrastination. We have to stop the distraction. We have to stop seeking reassurance. We have to stop going after perfection. Sometimes perfectionistic tendencies where we're checking over to see if there's any little error, making everything perfect, that is actually a form of trying to avoid worry. So we have to let that go. Uh, Googling symptoms and Googling things, that's trying to get reassurance. We have to let that, that's also an avoidance behavior, let that go. Um, Anyway, uh, all of these things, looking for kind of magical um, signs out there for our worry, like I'm gonna look for a sign out, out in the universe. We have to let that go. That's also uh, can become a compulsive behavior. Now, another thing that helps is called behavior activation. And that's where we start on purpose doing some enjoyable activities during our day. 
and allowing the negative thoughts or the worries or the what ifs to be there. They're, they're just going to be there, but we're going to do what we want to do, what we care about, what we value. If worry comes along, let it come along. And um, I kind of say, I, I like this expression that worry are like little kids in the back seat of the car. You know, they can get annoying sometimes, <laughs> but they're not driving the car, right? You're driving the car. So I hope that these techniques work. And until next time, I will see you in session. Take care. Bye-bye.